Holy crap. The show is awesome, guys. Thank you so oh, much for your you. time. Oh, thanks. Great. Thank you for bringing that energy in. Yeah. yeah that's no, awesome. no, you guys are amazing. Uh, it's it, The show's hilarious and, and also uh, super stressful, so I love it. Uh, <laughs> now, Billy, how many months of working out did it take so you could believably handle the invisible jackhammer? Um, I would say it was about 26 years. Wow. I could tell you put in some time. Yeah. Uh -huh. I apologize for assuming 15. it was just months. <laughs> no, not like that. But yeah, like my whole life to get in this. It, being the fat kid that wore <laughs> Speedos because my grandma made me wear it. I was like, I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> and so your grandma sorry, made you, wanna... you wear Speedos? What? Your grandma made you wear Speedos? I had to live with my grandma when I was 10 or nine. And then like, she fed me a lot, but then like, cause she's from like Lithuania, that's how they wore bathing suits. She was like, you wear, you wear uh, this, you know? <laughs> and so I grew up wearing Speedos at the beach with like a pot belly. And then I was like, never do that again. Oh, that's, I still, trauma, trauma. <laughs> it's still oh, how yeah. I look at the beach to this day. It's fine. Uh, Himesh, uh, th that opening one shot on the show following you through the production is so good and successfully made me never want to work in movies. How many <laughs> takes did you guys go through to get that right? You have told me this earlier. We went through how many takes? I heard it was 60 something. 60 something. In two days. Oh, it was really? Yeah. Yeah, we had to do, you know, yeah. I don't want to necessarily spoil it, but, you know, the, the, the effect of it all. Yeah. But, you know... It, there's there's there is a point at which we splice you know so it, it, it wasn't a true five minute you know take but ten. but wasn't we had ten? to do i don't know how long i think it's like a five minute thing and i'm including the times we like only made it like two seconds in yeah it. yeah yeah but all of the times we were yeah, 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 yeah. like ah start from the top again yeah so we lot. had one day of doing doing part one and the other day of doing part two and yeah, I think we went through quite a few. Times. I think everyone like it's that thing where we kept saying the line and we're like, I don't know how to be a human anymore. Mm -hmm. You did it so many times. Oh, my was, God. That the exercise I realized was like having to just repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it until it sounds like a binger movie. Yeah, yeah I, I guess that was kind of that. Yeah, you sort of just have to it, the the choreography of it just has to take a minute to embed itself. Yeah, no. Well, it's amazing. It's it's a super impressive shot. Um, Aya, seeing as how you've spent so much time on a franchise with the boys, did you experience any sort of PTSD making this? <laughs> well, I had a blast making the boys, so I, I I like entering this world and getting to make fun of it a little bit too. And luckily, everyone on the boys has a good sense of humor, except that one, you know. But um, <laughs> I uh, I really uh, I enjoy it, and and I think. Again, we're punching up. We're not punching down. So um, I, we all love superhero movies and we all love franchise movies. It's just that now it's become the thing as opposed to the storytelling. It's the name. And if it goes back to the storytelling, all this stuff is really fun and fun to be a part of. So I, I like that we're doing it. And it's a little, a little wink and a nod to all the craziness that we go through. Can you tease anything at all, though, about returning as Stormfront for Vought Rising? Like, if you guys, do you know when you're going to start filming or anything like that? I mean, I can, but HBO will cut it out. <laughs> uh, they, they, we're not paying to promote Amazon in this moment. Um, no, I, we don't actually know yet. I've read two scripts and they're absolutely insanely good. But that's about all I can tell you. I can't wait. Now, mirroring Pat's appearance on this show, uh, for whatever reason, doesn't have to be negative, but who's somebody in each of your careers that has made you personally the most nervous to see on set? Himesh Patel. Himesh Patel. I was <laughs> wow. I take it as a compliment. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Well, I'm, in what way are you saying nervous? Like you don't want to be around them. You're intimidated by them. You're actually like excited to meet them. Literally any way you want to answer it. I was trying not to corner you guys into saying anything bad about people. <laughs> That's very kind. I think it for me, honestly, starting any new project, you're always nervous. Like you, you are aware of all your colleagues out there, and like the 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 the, the depth of work they all have. So that I have admiration for so many people out there, and then you're like, oh my god, I get to work with these guys. Yeah, there's intimidation there every every day. You're like, I hope I can like 
rise up to like the thing I believe they are in my head. Mm -hmm. And then you work with them and you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have a deep, deep love for the Friday Night Lights cast. I am no longer allowed to meet anyone else because I have made a fool out of myself uh, in front of probably three quarters of that cast. Um, and I met Kyle Chandler on the set of Wolf of Wall Street and he shook my hand. He left the makeup trailer and I burst into spontaneous tears and I couldn't stop. And I had no idea. Like it was a visceral reaction to like meeting someone that I loved so, so dearly. Um, and that's probably the most intimidated I've been on set. I, I shook hands with Harrison Ford once. I totally understand. It was all I could do not to cry like a baby looking into his legend eyes. Um, last question for you guys. If there's a second season, what's an element of Hollywood that each of you would love to see the show skewer that this season doesn't tackle? Ooh, that's a good question. Good question. Why they pay me the medium bucks. <laughs> I mean, we've talked about this already, but like hair and makeup is not really explored and hair and makeup is where all the gossip happens. It's also yeah. where all the therapy happens. It's you yeah, know, so I know we wouldn't necessarily be skewering that. Yeah, we'd we'd, be skewering. we'd just in a way we we want we want to see the actors for sure. Use them yes, as therapists, as this, uh, yeah. Um, There's an element that your character kind of has with it, with the, your family and your daughter and the divorce and mm. stuff. And I think we don't. You never see that. Everyone's like, oh, the glitz and glamour of Hollywood, mm -hmm. Hollywood, and um, that but, it's unbelievable, but. It's an isolating life constantly. The sacrifice. The sacrifice yeah, yeah, yeah. that those months of your life are dedicated to people that you might never see again. You know, it's that's really a wild place to live, I think. Mm -hmm. um, Chris Killian with Comic Book. Ah, hi, guys. It's so nice to meet all of you. Hello, Chris. Hi. Uh Oh my God, I love this show. All of you are amazing in it. Not only is it hilarious, but it's super stressful. So thank you for your time. <laughs> Great, perfect. Now, Darren, roughly how many times do you think you said sparks will fly on the show? Oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot. That was fun to do, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I was trying to keep track and then I, I'm terrible at math, so I lost count. But I was like, that's a, he said that a lot because I'm sure there's a lot of takes that you there are so many board. takes. I'm, I'm just glad to see they cut different thing, different takes together. And uh, yeah, at least 50 times. <laughs> they now, just said, go with it, run with it. <laughs> I'd say Pat is pretty much the shittiest guy on the franchise. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but how? How much fun is it to play a character who says stuff like clam jam with zero consequences? <laughs> clam jam, yeah. Um, actually, clam jam was- uh, Clam jam requested. is what he uh, says. Just so we're clear. I say, what's, I know, my, I think my line to him is, what's the opposite of sausage party? A clam jam. Clam oh, jam. Yeah, yeah, okay, 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 I, I'm sorry, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you know that line about the, the hen- uh, Hens in the- uh, Yeah, cat uh, fights in the hen house. It was, it was cat fights in the hen house all day long, if you catch my, catch my drift, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, I mean, the best. How can you not love saying stuff like that? The greatest. <laughs> yeah. The greatest. The guy, I'd look at those lines and I would just say, thank you. Thank you for giving me this stuff to say. Now, as soon as I heard Clam Jam, I was on my phone making a note. I was like, Clam Jam, I got to remember this. <laughs> not just for this interview, but for all of my future you life. You want to start yeah. using it. Just be yeah. careful. Yeah, be yeah. careful. When you, be careful when you say that. No. <laughs> my wife has already been like, don't you dare. <laughs> Now, mirroring Pat on the show, you know, for whatever reason, doesn't have to be negative, but who in your career has made you each, like, personally the most nervous whenever they're on set? Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, my honest answer would be Lolly out of Fope. I was <laughs> so nervous. I mean, it's like stepping into the ring with Tyson. You got it. Like, I mean, forget about it. Yeah. First Thank day, you. she was like, you're going to bring it, aren't you? And I was like, yeah. She's like, you better. I went around to everyone individually and said, you better. Yeah. <laughs> and she kicked now, yeah. Maybe maybe we've already touched on this for Isaac, but for also each one of you, what was your favorite or maybe least favorite moment from the show that hit a little too close to home for your personal experiences in Hollywood? I don't know if it hit too close to home for me, but there was um, a scene where Nick Kroll as the gurgler is, he was improvising and he was kind of berating uh, Daniel, played by Himesh. And he said something like, oh, you're just like a first AD and first ADs are just like people who their dreams have died and they've kind of like settled for being a first AD rather than a director. And obviously like we have a first AD who then has to be like, okay, and cut there guys, thanks so much. 
So that felt like- And very, you just saw the heartbreak very, on his face. Yeah, it was kind of like, there are real people around, but it was obviously really funny. So good that he said that. What about for you guys? Yeah, I can't think of anything right now. Uh, there's that one scene where, um, you know, Billy's character, Adam, is, is doing this like really emotional scene where his wife has died. And it's uh, it's a shot that or it's a scene that Eric, the director, like wants in his movie so badly. And then you hear Daniel say, well, you know, you know, the scene's getting cut anyway. Like this is just for him. And they realize that the only way to keep this scene in the movie is to put the product placement in this scene. So then you see the little tractor roll in during this really heartfelt moment where Adam is like, you know, having this cathartic experience over his wife's death. And I'm like, how many times has something like that probably happened? Mm -hmm. I, as soon as that tractor started rolling in, I was losing my <laughs> I <laughs> loved it so much. Oh, it, in fact, that reminds me, just uh, just for fun, what's the worst case of product placement you guys have ever seen on, on something you've been attached to? Not mm -hmm. that I was attached, but I watched Madame Webb a couple of days ago. <laughs> Which I actually kind of enjoyed. <laughs> There's so much pepsi product placement oh really there's like she she lifts up a can of pepsi and she holds it and she's like really and they're like yeah you should be drinking pepsi and then at the end the villain dies because a huge p sign falls on him from like a pepsi cola like one of those like huge metal it's like, the famous one in the, yeah you can see from like Manhattan, the santa yeah. yeah like the christmas one but um yeah there was a lot of pepsi cola uh sponsored content in madame web and now i love drinking it so it works it works <laughs> No, it's probably the only way Madam Webb made money. Now, the show is hilarious. I Like I said, I love it. But were there any specific scenes you guys remember having a hard time making it through just without laughing or like a take that you completely ruined? <laughs> there was, in the pilot, Daniel and I are in front of that meet where I'm talking, Daniel, uh, the director, and I'm telling him that stuff's going to be cut. And we're just standing in front of the meet and I'm t and just just seeing his his sweet German face just not under we we would just we would break all the, it, it took everything in the world to not get through to be able to get through that scene I don't know what it was was that that was the one the pilot at the crafty table yes that whole scene because that was also the one where I choked on the cherry do you remember this <laughs> no what oh my god when we were we were um was we, it during the scene yes it was during the scene I, I I thought okay Bryson's a bit of a robot how how funny would it be if like he ate a cherry but he didn't chew it he just like swallows it whole oh, great. and so I you tried really to really tried to do how that? do you not remember this it was I was choking on the cherry for like seconds and then finally I just decided to like cough it up and I, I ended up chewing it and we kept going with the scene but then as soon as they called cut everybody just lost their you and swallowed a rot a ch a ch well no i choked cherry? on it i choked on the cherry and <laughs> I, I, I was hoping they would keep it in but they didn't but i'll never forget sam mendes being completely red-faced double <laughs> oh, oh, oh i don't remember me having just dying. my life flash before my eyes <laughs> Oh my gosh. God, I'm glad you made it. Uh, yeah. Now, I, I will. Life. last question for you guys. If there is a second season, what's an element of Hollywood each of you would love to see the show skewer that this season doesn't tackle? Like within the comic book <laughs> world, kind of? Like, like within... No, just Hollywood in general, whatever, yeah. you know? I think, like, intimacy coordinators. Is oh, like, that's a great one. Yeah. Yeah, because that's a big thing now. Like yeah. Putting, yeah. yeah, and what that's like. And I want to see how that actually works yeah. on set. Put your hand right under. <laughs> yeah, what does that look like? It's so inorganic, but I guess it has to be done now. Yeah, yeah. it's so funny. Wow. That's a great answer. Guys, thank you so much for your time. Thank I appreciate nice it. Nice to meet you. For everybody to see the show. Thank you. Hello. Holy crap. The show is awesome. Thank you so much for your time, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure. No, I I loved it. I, I plowed through like seven episodes straight. Like not only is it hilarious, but it's super stressful. So I couldn't get enough. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Daniel, given your own history as emo in the MCU, did you experience PTSD making this show? Like were there, <laughs> were there any scenes in particular that reminded you of like the chaos of making a superhero movie? Yeah, but it it, it wasn't uh, Marvel that I was thinking about because um, I uh, in, in the two times that I uh, was uh, you know working with them, uh, I was at the impression it's a it's a well oiled machine. Um, um, I I I didn't feel that amount of stress and absurdity, given you know the 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 amount of pressure and money that was behind these projects. But um, I guess they had done it so many times that I think at least. Uh, my perception was that um, 
things were going relatively well. But I did one film that I would not like to mention that was a total <laughs> show <laughs> from the second on I arrived. I mean, it really, and it went downhill when you, and when you thought you had reached the absolute, you know, valley that it <laughs> went even deeper. <laughs> so, and there was, and then you still have to go on, you know, and, 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 and honestly, that was so deeply frustrating. I was looking at my miserable face in that mirror every evening thinking like, how am I going to survive the next day? And um, there was no way around it. It just became really absurd, you know, with everything that could go wrong went wrong, you know. So um, I had to think about this one uh, uh, a lot. And then um, also my experience as a director, I only directed one small film, but um, that also was helpful for me to, you know, uh, remind myself of you know the, the 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 pressure that you have to cope with and the responsibility that you feel as a as a as a as the captain of the ship, uh, you know help help me. Mm. So the, as a comic book fan, then that means that you'd be open to returning to Zemo because that's I, once you were on this show, I was like, oh no, I hope he, I hope that doesn't mean we're going to see the last of Zemo. So that no, would be no. great. I mean, if if Marvel, <laughs> but um, you know, knowing the guys, um, they they uh, they have so much sense of humor. Uh, in fact, the second time around, um, uh, I was allowed to discover, you know, uh, a more funny uh, version of of Zemo, and they were pretty much open to that, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was a much lesser, you know, grounded version of that, you know, first uh, uh, installment uh, with with Zemo in, in Civil War. Um, so that showed to me um, they have a lot of sense of humor, and mm -hmm. I think that my friends at, at the MCU will will appreciate also this 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 show. And then, yeah, Zemo is is not. Dead. Zemo, is not, mean, Zemo is not dead. You heard it here first. Mm. Zemo is not dead. No. <laughs> I'm excited. I need more no. Zemo. Now, uh, mirroring Pat's appearance on the show, um, I wanted to ask you guys, for whatever reason, doesn't have to be negative, but who in your career has made you personally the most nervous whenever they're on set? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> you flatterer. <laughs> um, oh, who's made me the most nervous? I mean, I was pretty nervous on this set. I, ha I have to say, you know, like, I mean, you're turning up. Sam Mendes is directing, you know, this guy over here, you know, <laughs> this, this, this epic legend, we, you know, which is true. He is, right? I'm you not know, arguing. I, I, you know, don't, I mean, you couldn't yeah. argue with me. It's facts. So like, you know, <laughs> it was, it was, this was, um, everyone was like, you know, when you, when we kind of got there, it was like the game was mm. going and it was like the, yeah. the preamble had been long, yeah. you know, the build up. This has been something that Amadoui and Utri and Sam Mendes have been working on for years. They got John Brown. He's come off succession. He's been working. He's got the, and it's like, whoa, this is amazing. And you kind of get on set and Sam is doing these great big, long tracking shots and we're all like, whoa, yeah, you know, yeah. like trying to just keep up and trying to kind of mm. get into the, it was like, you're kind of waiting your turn to get in the thing. And it was, yeah. yeah so it was kind of like, it was, it was, it was that those first days on the pilot were, were like heightened. Like we were mm. all like just yeah. on our kind of a game really, you Did know, you it felt feel like there was a lot at stake and there was a, there was a lot to prove and we all wanted to just prove it, you know? Did you feel that the most when you were giving Daniel a manicure? Is that, is that what <laughs> I wasn't giving him a manicure? I was reading the notes off his hand. Oh, oh, sorry. I, I know, and that's it. not my fault that you didn't read that. That's the, probably the director. Sorry, it's Sam. True. It's true. I mean, that was you know, no, I will take full full blame for that. He had I, notes on his hand, and I was trying to take him down the notes. I I gotta say, I love the episode so much where, where you lose your cool about China. That's all I'll say. I don't want to spoil oh. anything, but it's so funny. Really? And it made me wonder, like, what's the most ridiculous product placement that either of you have seen on a project that you've worked on? Ooh. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, oh that's, that's a, a really, question. really good one. I mean, uh, you just kind of, it, there's sometimes it's just so blatant. I can't think, off the top of my head, I kind of can't think. You know, I mean, just whenever there's product placement, it's just so, it's just like, and and I, you know, I, I, I mean, I think the only time it's ever acceptable or kind of enjoyable is when people mock it, but you kind of can't mock it because you're not allowed to. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes it bad. 
Mm. Because if you could satirize it and make a joke about the fact that you had to, I mean, you, you could probably cite me a, a film or a movie that does mock their product placement. Maybe that's allowed to happen now because it should. You know, I, I, I will say I never wanted to buy a tractor until I watched. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it worked. Yeah, I, yeah. I was like, I got to go tractor shopping. You know, any product pla placement is just awkward. Yeah. You know, I remember um, that at once. And sometimes it's just so yeah. blatant. They once wanted me to really show the what I always find that very complicated to do it in a natural way. The the watch. So uh, in a film, oh I say I always had to make sure that they somehow okay. see the uh, see the see, very expensive the, watch. Right. Yeah. But uh, last that. question for you guys: If there was a second season of the franchise, what's an element of Hollywood that each of you would love to see the show skewer that this season doesn't tackle? Press junkets. Oh yeah, that's a great one. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've always yeah. I've always had a lot of sympathy for you guys. I, I, I try to I, I hope that I'm I'm making it a little bit more enjoyable than it can be, but uh, absolutely but no, I'm only kidding, but like uh, also the preamble to press junkers, which is the whole kind of experience of trying to find a stylist and trying to find a dress and trying to be dressed. Yeah. You know, that it because there's something really kind of like there's something very performative about kind of getting being dressed for these things. And yeah. you know, it's it's you, you kind of get taken to basements and yeah. shown these things that have come off the catwalk that basically yeah. just look like somebody's kind of ripped up a sort of sheet and sort of tight and you're like, okay, yeah, I'm kind of, you know, it's so there's there's so much. I don't know. And I would I was always thinking like one day I would love to see that actual film. I would like that premiere. Yeah. I would like to see Tecto. Yeah, I would like you know? to see Tecto. I would sure. love to see the red carpet of Tecto. That would be amazing. Thank <laughs> yeah. you guys so much for your time. I love the show. I appreciate it. And you're both amazing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hello. Good so nice to meet both of you. Holy hell. The show is awesome. You guys, oh, okay. it's it's amazing. I uh, I watched, I, I only have not seen the last episode. So I've just, I barreled through seven episodes with my wife and, uh, it's not only hilarious, super stressful. So thank you for your time. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you like it. Thank you. Yeah. Now, did either of you experience any sort of PTSD working on this show? Were there any scenes that maybe you felt like hit a little too close to home? I guess for me personally, the the stuff that Daniel has about not being around for his son and missing, you know, it's something really common in pe people that work in movies, the amount of time that you spend away and what you're missing and what you're sacrificing so that for me, it's like, it's not the funniest element of the show, but it's one of the more human things is, you know, the, the things that you miss and, and what you sacrifice to be there. And yeah, I, that was an important part of the show because it's it's true to the experience of mm. making these movies. You Your life is really, all, every, it's all consuming, right? Making these things. And I think that's why the relationships that people form are so deep because your personal life really does suffer and it's mm -hmm. that's tough yeah it's hard and also yeah. then it's why you keep asking yourself is it worth it yeah you know? so are you making a thing that you are proud of or are you making something that you think I don't know why we made this, you know, there's that, <laughs> right. there's that kind of yeah. existential yeah, no, question. I, I resonate with that completely. I mean, I did uh -huh. stand on the road for like eight years straight and I have a son. And so, you uh, know, right. that's, that yeah. it's tough. I, I totally. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's really mm -hmm. tough. Right. Yeah. yeah. Now mirroring Pat's appearance on the show for whatever reason, doesn't have to be negative, but who in your careers has made you personally the most nervous whenever they're on set? Oh, mm. that's an interesting one. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, yeah. uh, obviously, I worked on Succession for a while, and you might expect Brian Cox. What might make you quite nervous? He could he 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 can turn up on set, and you're all of a sudden you're just there's a you, you're different energy, and you want to be yeah, you want the day to go well for him, and you want it to be uh, you want, uh, what, what's amazing about Brian is that you will hear the sound of shouting coming from quite far away. And then everyone stops and then you're like, oh, he's telling an anecdote. It's fine. <laughs> he's just telling a story about shouting at someone. And then some days it's like, oh no, he's shouting. And you're like, oh, okay. But yeah, he's 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 lovely though. He's mm. very charming and you know, a, a true honor to work for. Yeah, but... one time I met him, he was a delight. Actually. Yeah, yeah. He, delight. he is. I guess he's he, yeah, when you have someone that's at the top of their game, you and they're around, you just want it, you want to not to disappoint them, right? So that's a... That's a, a thing, I guess. I think the only person who I've been worried meeting on set is a fireman in that uh, we were doing Avenue 5 and um, our set burnt down. <laughs> the stage went on fire. 
Oh my overnight. God. You know, so the whole thing was a heap of rubble the next morning. Yeah. Yeah. I could see why that might make you a little yeah. nervous. <laughs> so oh, still, if so... I'm shooting and I see someone in a farm, I think it's happened again. <laughs> <laughs> now, roughly how much of the series would you guys gauge percentage wise is based on true behind the scenes stories or experiences? That's a really good mm. question. I wouldn't know. I guess, we, you know, lots of research and it is amazing how, how often it's the true detail that that filters into the show that it's the things that you would never have expected to be real. You know, people getting blinded on set is something that did really happen. Yeah. People having panic attacks under their prosthetics, that's something mm -hmm. that does really happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of it we found, a lot of it we did find from reality and then you sort of build it out or you take a kernel of something and then mm -hmm. build it into its own story. Yeah, we would. We, we didn't often, you know, from our research, we wouldn't use people's personal stories specifically, but you would take the kind of energy of it sometimes. And, and the background, just getting the background to feel authentic, that sense yep. of... You know, all these things are meant to be planned, but a lot of it is very haphazard, last minute. You know, this character is no longer in this film. They're moving to that film. You know, the things that are very particular to an, a franchise as opposed to one movie, that, 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 that what you're making is actually going to be affected by several other projects at the same time that you have no control over. Now, I actually had a feeling that the eyeball sunburn was maybe from a true story. I was like, that's so random that that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Now, was there any aspect of Hollywood or franchise filmmaking that you guys felt you had to hold back from satirizing or was it all fair game? Uh, I think it, I think it's pretty fair game. Right. I think I, I would never want to target individuals or people or make it personal. But within that, I think uh, uh, as a product, as a thing that's so dominant in the culture, I think you have to be able to pretty much go at anything really outside. I'd never, we don't really make fun of individuals or there's not much of, of that, but we go, I'd say, yeah, we, we weren't afraid to try and go for what we felt was fair game and, you know, trying to get to the truth of why these films are, are the way they are. Mm -hmm. Now, do you guys have plans already for a second season? And if so, What's an element of Hollywood that you both would love to see the show skewer that this season doesn't tackle? Yeah, good question. We're still finishing season one, so it's <laughs> sort of still in the, in the trenches. I mean, they are interesting, aren't they? They're in an interesting phase. Marvel is specifically at the moment and the way that it's heading and it feels like it's starting to look back instead of just being a, this thing that moves forward. It's now entering this phase where it's starting to look back at its own glory and trying to mm. recapture that and that seems like an interesting thing that's happening across many many forms of popular culture music or even like sports or there's lots of like heritage rock acts now and there's footballers playing in these sort of leagues i feel like we are looking back to our recent past more and more often and instead of looking back to the 60s we're looking it feels like we're looking back to our very recent past and we're now in this cycle of nostalgia and that's something interesting and like movie stars, action heroes being in their eighties. And yeah, it's like, that's right, yeah. and like head like bands headlining Glastonbury that are like 80 year old men. And you're like, what's going on? Our culture's getting, all of our cultures are getting so old. And, and then, you know, unspoken yet so far as like AI and where that's right. going to take things, but also, uh, and we touch on it in season one, but that sense of, you know, a massive studio going through an identity crisis or even fearing for the worst, just not knowing what's going to happen next. Yeah. That sense, you know, you see these monoliths of these big studios as they're always going to be there, but what happens when they think it could be over? Right. We don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Absolutely. Those are great answers. Guys, I'm out of time, but thank you so much. Oh, okay, so pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for making the show. Like, I'm not bullshit. When I say I love it, I mean, it's oh, awesome. good. Oh, thank oh, I'm you. excited so for everybody to check it out. Thank you. Well, I hope you liked the last episode, but thanks a lot. Yeah. All right. Sounds great. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.